Darling, I'm pregnant. If you've, all right. if you've, if you've said those words or you've heard those words, um, you'll know the feelings that go along it, alongside with it. Excitement, apprehension, surprise, cold hard fear. Um, but something else happens, right? Your perspective changes, your outlook on things change. If it's your first child, for instance, you stop living in the present. You start thinking about the future. You start planning for the future and you start trying to influence the future. You're trying to think about what's coming and how you can meet it. You know, if it's children, it's things like, you know, good upbringing, good education, you want the best for them. And how many of us are still just living in the present when it comes to what we're doing every day at work, when it comes to the things we're doing in our jobs? We need to be thinking about the future or just risk being consigned to the past. Now, this isn't supposed to be a pep talk about your career or you know, and your job or anything like that, but I do need you to understand why this is important. Everything around us is evolving. Technology is constantly changing. It's what makes everything we do exciting. It's why we're in technology, right? It's because things keep changing, things keep moving, and we need to keep evolving with it. Evolve or get left behind. I used to do a talk where um, I would build a, a bot uh, in a session, over like an hour-long session, from kind of start to finish, which was terrifying. Um, and it normally worked out okay. And I don't do that kind of talk anymore, mostly because it's too stressful and I'm getting old. Um, but also, what's the point? The technology's moved on. It's way easier to do those things that it was even two years ago. Um, we're going to build a bot in this session, um, but it's only going to be a part of what we're doing, and we're going to cover so much more, because actually, things like just building a bot, a simple bot in Teams, is actually kind of easy now. So, do you want an example of how easy it is to do this kind of thing? So, building a bot in Teams today, do you want an example of how easy that is? Yes. Well, I don't care if you do or not, because that's exactly what you're going to get. Um, so, last year, we had a work experience um, person join us for three days. Her name was Holly, and she was 15 years old. In two and a half days, she'd built this. This is a Spotify bot. Holly built it so we could control the Spotify instance that we have running in our dev office. So you can give it commands, you can see what's playing, you can search for and play new tracks. Two and a half days, 15 years old. This is the future. Evolve or die, you've never needed to move so fast. So, where are we? What are we doing? Where are we at? You need to be asking yourself what's next. What's next for the world? What's next for technology? What's next for communication? What's next for me? Because what's next is really important. If you don't figure out what's next, somebody else will and overtake you. So let me pitch you something. Everything is reducing to data. Data is becoming really important. The kind of iterations we've had in cloud storage and processing mean that we can work with massive amounts of data in real time. And that's changing all sorts of industries, and not just our own. It's changing things like insurance. Driving is the most obvious example of an entire problem domain being reduced to data. But things like medicine, legal, all these places are reducing down into data. Companies that harness the right data with technologies and things like AI are going to have an almost unfair advantage over the competition. Look at this quote. If you corner the market in data, you probably have more wealth advantages than if you corner the market in gold or oil. Data is the real place where the money is. Does anyone know who said that? Nope, 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 nope. You might think, I've had, so people before have said maybe Mark Zuckerberg, maybe Bill Gates. Actually, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So. If you think about what I'm saying right now is kind of way out there and futuristic and you don't need to pay attention, you need to think again. With respect, if the Archbishop of Canterbury is talking about this, then it's very real and it's out in the real world and it's happening. So why do you care? Why do you guys care? Well, just like oil, data is not valuable in itself. Just like oil, it needs to be processed and consumed. People need ways to communicate with their data. How we communicate with our machines is changing and evolving, and it's going to be one of the most disruptive changes in our industry. So, are you all evolving to take advantage of this? Did you know, for instance, that bots are the new apps? Huh, I hear you think. Tom's gone crazy. Either you know. Okay, <laughs> Tom's gone crazy. 
He's been spending too much time with bots, um, and he thinks they're going to replace all our apps. OK, let me take you through this. I want to show you something. This is not, this is an idea. So here's a theory. And it's not my theory. I've stolen it from someone else. And that is that technology moves in these 10-year life cycles. So let's start all the way back in the 80s, before Microsoft. It was IBM that were dominant, that era of the mainframe. And Microsoft were just this kind of small startup company in a garage. But the technology is changing. The future of being a disruption of the present. And the introduction of the personal computer is what changed everything. And the reason it changed it is because you could do new things and do them from new places, not just the office. You could do them at home. And this is what catapulted Microsoft into this dominant position and made them that new IBM. But, I mean, just think about that for a minute. Actually, dominate, like, went from almost nothing to this kind of dominant position. Think about that tagline at the time. A computer on every desk and in every home. It's like a dominating tagline to have. But they became like IBM. And just like IBM, dominance is a dangerous place to be. Because it's really hard when you're in that position of strength to see what's next. When you're making loads of money, you're not incentivized to change. But the technology changes regardless. That 10-year technology life cycle. So what happened? Microsoft failed to see the rise of the internet. They didn't get it. They didn't see it coming. And they kind of ignored it until it was too late. And that explains how they went from um, how Microsoft went. I've lost my animations, but never mind. Um, Microsoft failed to see the rise of the internet. They completely ignored it. And it means that they kind of lost the web. And they seeded search to, the Google, to Google in like that 10-year life cycle. All of that search, like that internet, that web stuff, again, it's a disruption. It means you can do different things in different places. In the era of the 90s, you're not going to build a dating app without the web. Who are you going to date? Like the people on your LAN, really? <laughs> By the way, as an aside, think about how your Google search results look today. White background, blue links, ads top and right. It hasn't changed in 20 years. It's hard to change things when you're making money. 10 years after that, Microsoft failed to see the rise of mobile and that next era. They kind of waited and waited. And then they tried to enter with Nokia in 2013. We all know how that went. Kind of another missed opportunity. So the wheels went off this bus, but something kind of massively needed to change. Um, they needed to figure out what that next 10 years looked like. They needed to change. They needed to evolve. They needed to evolve to survive. That simple and that hard. So Microsoft doubled down. February 2014, announced a new CEO. This is hopefully not news to you guys, Satya Nadella. In the last five years, if you weren't paying attention, we've just witnessed one of the largest corporate turnarounds in our industry. We've seen the cloud kind of killing off the web and changing how the web operates. I mean, who runs their own web server at home anymore? Right, like if I'd asked that 10 years ago, almost every hand here would have gone up. And it meant, it means all the data is in one place. And that is interesting. Data and AI. And Microsoft are embracing that all in. Microsoft are becoming a platform company. See? Platforms. Everything is reducing to data. This UI is becoming invisible. OK. I'm going to take you one, through one more work example, because I can tell you still don't really believe me. So let's talk about the weather. This is how you found out what the weather was like in the 1990s. You'd go to Yahoo. You'd search, I want the weather. For your location, you'd get a ton of pages about the weather, a ton of pages about your location. If you were lucky, you'd find exactly what you're looking for. You were the hunter-gatherer of this data. You had to go to the web and find what you wanted. Every day, out hunting, finding the bit of information you wanted and bringing it back. So fast forward 10 years. What did you do to get the weather in the 2000s? You used an app. Apps were the big thing. Apps give us a better experience for the weather, because the app knows where I am. It knows what I'm interested in, and it can have the information ready for me. Okay. So I need to find the right app in order to do that. So I'm not a hunter-gatherer anymore. I've got all these apps that will do the work for me, but now I have to kind of look after these apps. I need to kind of keep them updated and keep them fed and watered and happy. I've become a shepherd of apps. Okay. Go forward another 10 years. What are we doing kind of today? Um, not quite 10 years, but like, 
What are we, what are we doing today? What, are, what have we been doing for a while if we want to get the weather? Siri, what's the weather today? Alexa, do I need an umbrella tomorrow? Like, these are bots. They're the natural extension from apps because we don't even need to think about the kind of app we want. We just say what we want and it happens. Like, the bot ecosystem figures that stuff out. Is this perfect? Absolutely not. Is it still evolving? Yes, it is. This is our future. So right now, there's a lot of typing that happens when you want to talk to bots rather than natural speech talking, but that's going to change. Like, really soon, that's going to change. And soon, we'll just be talking to the walls and asking for what we want. We've gone from hunter-gathering through shepherding, and then this is the kind of McDonald's drive through of data collection. It's exactly what I want when I ask for it without me having to do any work. So, that's the landscape. That's why this stuff is so important. Bots are here, they're staying, and it's how people are going to communicate with their data. Data is king. Whoever can process and present that data the best will be the kingmaker. And all of us, we're communication enthusiasts and communication experts in our field, right? This feels like a massive opportunity. So, I know what you're thinking right now. I hope. Tom, this is great, but I'm not a developer. I can't do this. All right. Everything is reducing to data, and I don't know what to do. OK, so by show of hands, hands up. Who is, would class themselves as a developer? OK, that is better than normal. OK. <laughs> who, who does PowerShell? Hey, so you are all developers. You just don't think you are. Good. Fine. So the secret with all of this is that development is not as hard as it used to be. And because it's all moving so fast, most developers are making it all up anyway. So I said we were going to build a bot in this session. So let's start that process off, and let's come back to it later, because Azure takes a couple of minutes to kind of spin stuff up. We are going to create a bot in Azure, and we're going to do it as if you've never done it before. So if you have done it before, well, I apologize. Um, all right, and I'm going to do it turning and talking to the. Oh, no, no. I might be able to do it here. Right, perfect. So I'm in as you. Hopefully, this is not a new experience to you. Um, I've got a brand new empty resource group called Evolve on Tour. And I'm going to create a new resource. And the resource I'm going to create, so you can find it later, you can go home and try this, is a web app bot. OK, so let's assume you've never done this before. Like all the good Azure resources, if you're coming to them for the first time, you pretend you know what you're doing, and you go down this list and try and figure it all out. So um, let's call it Evolve Conf on Tour. Um, let's put it in my existing resource group that I made so we can see it when it's done. Right, so you're going down this list thinking, OK, this is good, this is good, this is good. Is there a free one? Yes, there is. Perfect. Uh, this is good, this is good. So what template you'll come to? OK, look, well, let's have a look at that. So there's two things in here. There's an echo bot and a basic bot. OK, well, actually, can we create a solution that already does something? That would be useful, because if we're not a developer, we're coming to this for the first time, actually, having some working code that we can look at is super useful. So actually, let me choose this echo box. It's a simple bot that echoes back the user messages. Right, perfect, let's do that. Other stuff, other stuff, other stuff. I'm going to turn off App Insights. The only reason for doing that is to make this slightly faster to build. It's going to think about it. If I've typed everything incorrectly, it will then start making it. I'm just going to make sure that definitely kicks off before we go back to the slides for a minute. So we're going to come back to this in a minute once it's built. Um, all right, perfect. So let's carry on. You said you all did PowerShell. Oh, it's just cut off. Perfect. Right. This is one thing you can do today if you didn't know about that is a kind of low-code, no-code solution for integrating everything and anything that talks with PowerShell into Microsoft Teams. Go to your favorite Microsoft Teams channel. Right-click on the ellipsis. Go to Connectors. Click New Connector. Go and call a... Oh, I'll, find it. I'll find it in a minute. A new, it's called a new incoming webhook. Okay? Call it whatever you want. Click Create. You will get a link, a massively long string link. You can post stuff to that link, and it will show up in that channel in Teams. This is how you do that in PowerShell. It is not very complicated. That's that big link at the top. 
and all I'm doing is invoking a web request to post to it. When you do that, you get a nice card that looks like that. You can put that PowerShell anywhere you're doing PowerShell stuff that's got an internet connection. Job failed to run, backup completed, conflict errors, whatever else it is, do it there, visualize that stuff in Teams. It's super, super useful. It's something you can do. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, go there. You, hopefully you can just about see it, bit.ly slash cards from PowerShell, um, and take that code and put it in today. All right. So I'm going to draw on some experiences from putting a Teams from absolutely kind of nothing through into the App Store. And this application that I wrote a while ago is called Remember This. So you can find it in the Teams App Store today. It works by reminding you about conversations in Teams. Okay, so if you've got a conversation going on in Teams, like if you've got a busy team, it's actually quite easy for conversations to get lost as more stuff comes in, and then you're kind of scrolling up and it scrolls out and disappears. With Remember This, what you can do is you literally kind of at mention, remember this, and say like in two days, next Tuesday, tomorrow at four, whatever. It will give you a thumbs up. And then all that happens, when that time kind of elapses, whenever it is, you'll get a little message that says, hey, bring this to your attention. And it, all that's going to do is bring it back into your activity feed. It's going to bring it back into your scroll window space. So if you've got like, that's an interesting conversation. I need to follow up with it in seven days' time. Oop. Like, this is a kind of really easy way of doing that. So it's super simple, but it kind of does one thing well. And I, it was useful for me to go through that whole process of what does it take to actually not just write the code, but get it into the Teams App Store. So let's assume you have never built an application before, but you've got an idea for something you want to build. So where do you even start? What, what's the process you should go through? So first rule, you kind of, you've got to have a plan. You need to know what it is you want to build. Let me tell you about my A-level computer teacher, who is one of the few teachers I still remember. His name was Mr. Toon, and there's two reasons I'll remember him. The first is he was allergic to peppermints, which sounds like a kind of interesting thing, but we went on a, we went on a field trip to, uh, so <laughs> this is back in like the early, late 90s, early 2000s, if you're doing computing and you go on a field trip in the UK, you go to the Meteorological Weather Centre at Bracknell to go and look at their Cray supercomputer, because that's just what you did. So we went there, I don't remember anything about the Cray supercomputer, but what I do remember is that on the way back, one of us, it wasn't me, had some mints, had eaten some mints, and Mr. Toon could smell these mints, and we were all like in a minibus, he was driving this minibus, and, uh, and he demanded to know who it was that was eating mints and causing his allergic reaction to go crazy. I can't even remember what it was that like Harry reacted, apart from making him really grumpy. Anyway, I think if he could have lined us all up and like had him breathe on him to like figure out who it was, he would have. Anyway, the reason I remember it so vividly is that his answer to this was to wind down all the windows and drive home this minibus for two and a half hours in February because I was absolutely freezing cold. Why am I telling you this? The other reason uh, for remembering Mr. Toon was a massive sign he had in his computer lab that he would constantly point to and that I still remember kind of today, which is this. Typing is no substitute for thinking. Like, it's really easy with development and with coding to kind of jump into writing something straight away. But you've got to, like, you've got to approach this. You're, the thing you're going to build, the Teams application you're going to build, is an interaction with the user. Um, if you're writing a bot, there's no user interface. Like that bot, that conversation is the entirety of the user interface. If you don't get that interaction right, people won't use it. Users have choices. Users have never had so many choices as now. So you need to be good. There's three things to consider first. I'm going to go through each of these. Basically, this is kind of a, quite a good checklist to go through before you kind of start getting your hands dirty. So viability. Basically, can you even build the thing that you want to build? Is it even possible? given the constraints that we have right now. And this is a changing picture. This is a changing landscape, so the answer today might be different from the answer in a year's time. How do you answer this question? Best place? So this is what it looks like today. Um, and this is a screenshot of the Teams landing page, the Teams developer landing page, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, these are kind of at a really high level, the things that you can do in Teams today. So you need to make sure you just about, like you want, you don't need to know how to do all of these things. You need to know that they exist so that you can line up the things you want to build with the experiences you can offer. 
Okay, so really quickly, tabs, I'm sure you've seen these, surfacing content inside Teams. Essentially, they're a web page with some interaction if you need it. Bots, everybody knows about bots, everybody wants to build a bot. Messaging extensions, I'm hoping you've seen those. Down by the compose bottom uh, bar where you add your images and your GIFs, like you can add stuff in there. So if, let's say you want to do product lookup to a product database. You could have a little button in there that pops up a search. People can search in their product database. You can pull through a nice looking card of product, quantity, link to the CMS, whatever, and throw it in the conversation. That's a genuinely useful thing you can do. Connectors, we just talked about connectors, good way of surfacing third party data inside of Teams. And then you also have control over the activity feed. So you can throw things into a user's activity feed if you want to. Okay, hopefully none of that is like too much of a surprise. Um, though that is a, like a high level, the functionality that you have that you should like understand before you start building anything. This is constantly changing. Um, the best way to keep up to date is that big link along the bottom. Um, that's the landing page for the developer platform for Microsoft Teams. The other reason for going here is that there's loads of samples here. There's loads of demo code in a variety of different languages. There's loads of open source stuff. This is a good place to start. Um, there's loads of videos. There's a tech community. There's a special place in the tech community for it as well. This is a really good place to go. Cool. Oh, yeah. So. Um, Really quick sidebar, Compose extensions, if you want to build, this is a shameless plug, if you want to build a uh, line of business applications in Teams using Compose extension, there's a walkthrough, there's sample code in GitHub, you can go and try it, um, try it today. So if you're interested, links for all that stuff. All right, so that's viability. Usability, so usability is really important. Um, it's probably way more important than people give it credit for. Because if your thing's bad to use, people won't use it. Make it easy make it fun, make it enjoyable, people will forgive you a lot. Think about the journey, especially for bots. Think about the journey, the user journey users are going to go through. Don't get them like stuck in a corner. And if you need to ask them questions, let's say you need to ask them for the day of the week, you're not writing another command line application from 20 years ago. Don't give them a whole like press one for Monday, two for Tuesday, three for Wednesday thing. Either give them some nice cards, which I'll show you in a minute, um, that you can click on, or just do natural language. It's not as hard as it looks. We're going to do a bit of natural language in a minute. Um, but like, just have them type in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, and deal with it that way. I said I was going to talk about cards. These are things that you can put in the conversation. I'm sure you've seen them with some third-party apps in Teams. And they let you send more than text. They let you round out that experience. They're a bit of an answer to that. You know, The only conversation you have with a bot is text. You can put in images. You can put in buttons. There is a bit of support across different platforms. So if you're just building for Teams, just understand what the support looks like for, for Teams. Um, but if you're building across kind of lots of different channels, which we're going to touch on in a second, um, then fine, you can look at that. Um, there's a really good card editor I'm going to show you towards the end when we talk about something else. So make a mental note for that. Um, but just be aware that you can send these cards. Finally. Think about like I put tooling in libraries, and what I really mean here is like stealing and reusing stuff, and that's not a bad thing. Like everything's built on somebody else's thing. Um, I don't know if you are aware of a gentleman called Scott Hanselman. Um, he calls it abstracting on the shoulders of giants, which I think is really cool. So if you're starting out, there are loads of resources. So make use of them. Um, there's a load there. The one at the bottom is kind of new. So if you're a big enterprisey type thing and you want to build a proper like virtual assistant solution and you want to make sure you've covered absolutely everything and you want a working sample to start with that is way too complicated for what most people would build but is just right for really big kind of corporate solutions, that's a good place to go. Okay? Because it is big and it is fairly unwieldy, but it has thought of absolutely everything on ramps of conversations, off ramps of conversations, actions, all these kind of things. The other thing worth pointing out is the bot builder community. So if you're building bots, go and check those guys out. Loads and loads of samples, loads of friendly people um, as well, ready to answer questions. Whilst we're talking about tooling and libraries, here are some other things. So I've talked about this a little bit in passing, but it's, this is a massive part of building bots on Teams. Okay, this bot framework or bot service. Th that's the thing that we used when we were in Azure a couple of minutes ago when we created a new web app bot. We are creating one of these. 
This is not a Teams thing, okay? This is bigger than just Teams, okay? This is across lots of different communication platforms. It's still Microsoft owned, it's still living in Azure, okay? The idea being, you create your bot on this bot framework, and then you enable it for different channels. One of those channels can be Teams, or could be Skype for Business, or could be an embedded in a web page, or could be Slack, or Twilio, or a million other things, right? Um, the idea is you write one set of code, and the bot framework deals with the ugly, lots of different language support, interacting with all these other channels, okay? That's the kind of theory. It works really well with cognitive services, as we'll see in a minute, and there are a bunch of, like, purpose-built SDKs for it. There's a bunch of sample code and stuff like that. So if you are building a bot, you need to get on board with this. So that's the thing you kind of search for. Those are the samples you need to find. I've talked about natural language processing a couple of times as if it's easy. Um, actually, it's a lot easier than it used to be, and it sounds crazy hard and crazy magical. Here's the really high level, I'm hoping there's no experts in the room, explanation. So if you've got a sentence like, I want to fly from London to Redland, that sentence in itself is called an utterance. So the things people say are utterances, okay? Now, the intent of that sentence is to travel, let's say, okay? So if we're talking in their language, this natural language processing language, the intent is to travel. You could have a completely different utterance, like, get me the quickest flight from London to Redmond tomorrow. That intent is still to travel, okay? And then entities within that utterance are like almost like the parameters. So in our, our one, it might be London and Redmond. I keep changing the city name, but like you get the idea, right? They're the things that change. The intent stays the same. So as a developer, it's actually way easier to work with a service like this that will take an utterance that the user gave you and break it down for you and say, yeah, I know this is what the user said, and I know they spelled half the words wrong, but the intent was to fly, and your parameters are London and Redmond. Now, as a developer, that is way easier to work with than here's a massive string that the user said, good luck, which is how we used to have to do it. So I'm going to show you that in a minute. We're going to do like a live example of that. Oh, yeah, finally, so if you're doing that language understanding stuff, so let's step back a bit. This natural language thing is called Lewis, Language Understanding Intelligence Service, I think. Okay. And it's an online service, it lives in Azure, you call it, you, get, you set it all up, you tell it what your utterances are, and it gives you an API endpoint that you can call, and it gives you back the intents and the entities. And that works really, really well. In my example of remember this, building that kind of simple app, I needed to have some way, when the user said, remember this tomorrow, remember this in two days' time, to turn that into a date and time string, and I didn't want to do a load of work. I could have used this, absolutely I could but I would be paying the service cost to do this because this would be living in Azure. Anytime anybody, and this is now in the App Store, remember, so it's like hundreds of thousands of people using it, every time anybody typed to it, I would go through the service, okay, and I was a bit worried about the costs. So I looked around a bit, and it turns out the Lewis team have put a load of their work into GitHub and called it Offline Lewis. So there are NuGet packages that you can get. Don't worry if you don't want NuGet packages, it's code that you can put in your software, right? Um, so this now runs, like, for simple things like date-time recognizers, um, you can actually take this and run it entirely offline. And that's what I'm doing with Remember This. I'm doing things like this, where you get this recognizer. It's quite simple code. Put in, like, next Tuesday, 9 a.m., and it comes back with an actual date-time string that you can work with. And that's obviously way cheaper, because you're not paying any service costs. It's just code. And there's things in there for, like, dates, times, IP address, look up, like, it'll figure out from a sentence what a valid IP address is, um, like, phone numbers, all sorts of things. Okay. Finally, worth telling you about, but not going to dig into too much detail, is a thing called Ngrok. So, briefly, this bot framework thing I've been talking about, it runs your code. So the way it works is a user talks to the bot framework. They, they think they're talking to a contact, a bot, in Teams, let's say, and they ask, you know, what's the time, what's the next train to Manchester? Teams goes, oh, I'm talking to a bot, fine. I need to go to the bot framework and ask that question. The bot framework goes, oh, yeah, okay, it's that bot, so I need to call Tom's code over here, okay? And that's how the interaction works. Your code is responsible for saying, for figuring out the actual answer. The bot framework is just doing that translation for you. Um, all of that means that your code needs to be accessible 
by the bot framework in real time so that it can be called almost like an API. Okay? All of that means your code needs to be publicly accessible somewhere on the internet, normally in Azure. Okay? Now that's secured and everything, and there's like proper security behind that, but it makes it really hard for doing local development where you're used to having everything running on your local machine. NGROC is a way around that. Um, Basically, it provides you a nice HTTPS endpoint to a local host. So you can be running local hosts on your machine. This gives you a nice HTTPS endpoint, like you can see here, katesapp.ngrop.io, and it routes through to your local host. Okay, this is super useful for doing uh, local development, but telling, like convincing the bot framework to still work because you give it something it can see. And this is nice because you can do break and debug and all these sort of normal things there. Okay. And Obviously, Azure in the tooling and library section, but like, make sure you explore around a bit because you know, Azure is more than you know, just the kind of web app and VMs and stuff. There's a lot of interesting resources that mean, like, if you use them in the right way, they can be quite cost efficient. So let me give you an example. This, remember this thing. So I'm going to say remember this in two days, and then in two days' time, I want it to come back and post back into Teams, right? So my first thought was like, okay, well, I need to write all that stuff to a database, all the times, and then I need to have something poll in this database to figure out, do I need to send this message yet? Do I need to send this message yet? And all that sounds quite expensive at scale. So I looked into a bit more, and Azure has queues and storage tables and things. Okay, So queues are interesting, because you can put stuff into a queue, and when it goes into the queue, you can trigger code that runs when it goes into the queue. So I started off there, writing an Azure function that triggered every time I put something in the queue. Okay. That didn't really solve my problem, because all it just meant was like, as soon as it went into the queue, like, it would pick it up and put it back into Teams. But with queues, you can actually put something in the queue with a start time that is in the future, and it won't actually show up in the queue until that start time. And that's a kind of like scheduling engine by cheating. So that's exactly what I'm doing. When you say, remember this in two days, I put it into the queue with a start time of two days' time. In two days' time, it sort of appears in the queue my Azure function picks it up and sends it back to Teams. I don't pay for any of that. I only pay the cost whilst it's in the queue, which is milliseconds, okay, and is really, really cheap. So I get that kind of scheduling for free. So that's an interesting like, the, the way you can do this. And especially if you're writing an app that is going up to the store, you have to think about like penny pinching, unless you don't care about money at all, in which case it's fine. Um, but otherwise, you, you want to be ready for like potentially lots of people using your app. Okay. Have a quick check of the time. Perfect. So let's go back to this demo. Let's actually build something. So hopefully this is done. And again, we're coming to this for the first time. This is a super wobbly table. Um, we're coming to this for the first time. We have never built a bot before. So again, what do we do? We look down the left-hand bar and try and figure out what to do next. We know we've built a bot, but that's kind of about all we do know. So let's look down the bar. So some interesting things in there. The one that kind of sticks out maybe as being interesting is the one called testing web chat. Okay, well let's try that. So when we click that, straight away we actually have a conversation window, which means technically we can probably talk to this bot. And we know when we created it, it had some sample code in it. So, I mean, let's try it. Anything could happen. Okay, fine. Hello and welcome and echo hi. Okay. So it, sound, it feels like, let's try this out, it's just going to echo back everything we say. And that sort of makes sense because the template when we created it was called an echo bot, so seems fair. So this is useful in one respect because now we've gone from nothing to having a bot that we can interact with that is based on sample code, okay? So we can now change this sample code and we can always come back here. We haven't got involved in any channels, we haven't distributed it anywhere, this is just us and Azure figuring out what to do next, okay? So what else? So we've got channels, I spoke about those, and in here, this is where you can see you can add, um, I love these images, how they're beautifully stretched. Um, you can add different channels, such as Teams, and we'll come back here in a minute. But let's look at this build one. So, again, reiterating, you're not a developer, there's no code, like, you know, fine. You don't have any kind of, you don't have Visual Studio installed, you don't have anything like that. You come to this build tab anyway, and there are some kind of instructions for build, test, and publish, which you can go through if you really want to. Or down the bottom, it says, yep, so it's got some options. So I can download all of this source code. So I could download it all and run it on my machine in Visual Studio. I did that last night. 
We're going to cut to it in a minute because it's easier than, well, it's certainly more interesting than me downloading it in real time now, unzipping it, and you waiting for that to happen. Um, so I'll show you that in a minute. But also, just look at this. There's an online code editor. So if you don't have Visual Studio, just open it in a new tab and sign in. Hopefully just the once. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so this is super useful if you don't have any tools. Because look, now, ignore all of this if you don't know what it is. Doesn't matter. Do remember this thing. Most developers are making this stuff up anyway, right? So ignore the fact that readme still isn't loading. It wasn't very useful anyway. Let's just look down this list, OK? So you haven't got a clue what any of this stuff does. But you know you have a bot that runs that echoes back what you say, OK? Look down the folder list and see what's interesting. Bin doesn't sound that interesting. Bots, that sounds quite interesting. So echo bot, well, that sort of makes sense as well, because that's the thing we had. Let's just click on it and have a look at it. OK, it's not super complicated. OK, yes, it's code. Like, you won't melt. It's fine. All right, so there's two sections here, right? This one's called on members added something. This one's called on message activity. And you can see the text that you saw when we were trying it out, right? So without knowing anything about how this code runs, you've, you can see the points at which like, you could put your own stuff in here, right? You could change this. We are going to change this, OK, to do our own thing and completely ignore everything else, because all the everything else doesn't matter. This is the point at which it sends back the text that you gave it. That's all we need. The rest of it we can ignore for now. Like, if we want to change what happens every time somebody arrives, rather than saying hello and welcome, yeah, we can do that as well if we want. Or if we don't want to, we could just delete it. OK? That's the approach to take. Ignore all the stuff you don't need to worry about. Focus in on this bit. This is the line that you would change. If you wanted to change that default behavior of take the text that came in and send it right back out again. Right. Let's do that. So I downloaded this, or a really similar version of this, last night. OK? This is not magical jumping to smoke and mirrors. So. This solution list is almost identical to the one that we saw in the code editor. And this section here is exactly the same. Yeah? You've got the on message, you've got the echo, you've got the hello and welcome. Two things I want to show you. So I said you can run this locally. And you definitely can. If you're just writing bots, there's a bot emulator that saves you the hassle of making a change, publishing it all the way up to the web, and then doing it in that test in web chat thing. Okay? You can do it all locally. If you run this solution, this is what you get. It says your bot is ready. You can run it in the emulator. And it even tells you where to go and what to put in. So Bot Framework Emulator is a free thing. You can get it. I'll Google it. Um, it's called the Bot Framework Emulator. What you do is you come here. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, like a really quick amount of time, going through this. You fill up. It wants the endpoint. It wants a name, app ID, and password. So that's the endpoint just there. If you don't know what your app ID and password are, and why would you? Because you've just created this bot, right? And you've no idea what's going on. Have a look in, there's a file called appsettings.json, and it's got your app ID and app password. Okay? You copy those, you put them in here, you set it all up, and then you've got a locally running version where you can send things to it. It will think about it. It may or may not work. Yep. Okay? And it echoes them back. How do you know it's a locally running version? Well, if it's running this local code here, I ought to be able to put a breakpoint on here. Okay, which means whoa, if I come here again, breakpoint gets hit, right? So no magic involved. We are running this code locally, right? So we've got a simple echo bot, and that's fine. Let's make it more interesting. Let's make it a bot that gives us the weather, okay? That's a thing. That's a vaguely useful thing to want to do. Um, and let's make it a bot that gives us the weather for wherever we want to be. So London, Manchester, New York, whatever. Right? What, does that, what does it mean to build something like that? Well, there's sort of two parts to that. The first is figuring out if your users are going to go up to your bot and say, what's the weather in London? Right? What do you do with that? Because like, you need to figure out, are they asking about the weather, or are they asking about something completely different? And where are they asking for the weather for? If that sounds like utterances, intents, and entities, you'd be absolutely right. So we're going to use Lewis and natural language processing to answer that question. And once we've figured out that we want to get the weather and where, we'll just call a simple like weather API 
service to get us the weather, get back the data, and present it nicely in a bot. Okay, make sense? Sound feasible? Good, I hope so. All right, so first things first, natural language processing. How do we go from, um, you know, what's the weather in London to actually something we can use in code? So come with me here to lewis.ai. Lewis.ai is the kind of dashboard entry point for writing these natural language processing apps, okay? This is not gonna be a very good tutorial of how to use Lewis. It's gonna be like a top 1%, let's get through this as quickly as possible and get something working, okay? I just wanna show you how useful and how powerful this can be, okay? So let's just call it Evolve Weather. Let's not give it a description. Let's ignore the tutorial. We come through to a nice dashboard. Okay, so if you're building this in the real world, this dashboard would tell you all the times like users didn't quite get an intent. Maybe you could tune the model, make it better. Anyway, this is a brand new model. It knows nothing about what we want to do. So we need to go to the build section. Okay, and we've landed on a thing called intents, okay, which lines up with what I just told you, which is good. And we're gonna create a new intent for the weather. Now you could create, in this natural language processing engine, you could have as many intents as you want. If you wanted a bot that told you about the weather and train times and something else and something else, go for it, right? They're all just different intents. So I'm gonna create a new intent. I'm gonna call it weather. Okay, so it wants examples. Example utterances of what users might say for this intent. So here's one. What's the weather in London? Seems fair, yeah. What else might a user say? Well, they might say, tell me the weather in New York, right? Like, you could go on like this for a while, okay? And we're not going to because that's kind of boring. Like, the idea is you build these out, like you try and think of all the weird and wacky ways in which users might talk to you about, fine. That is examples for your intent. Now. Some of these words are actually entities. So London, New York, they're entities, okay? They change over time and they mean, different, they mean something specific in our example. So I can hover over these and I can pick, say, London and I get a choice to add an entity. Now, I could make my own from scratch or I can use pre-built ones. Happily, there are pre-built engines for things like ages, date times, dimensions and geographies, okay? As well as lots of other things. Um, temperatures, URLs, right. So I'm gonna say geography, perfect. What does that mean? Notice how it's also taken New York and got rid of London and said geographies, got it, okay? I can put any location in there now, okay? This will come back and figure it out. The intent was whether the entity that you care about is this thing. Now, you're supposed to spend a lot longer building these out, but we haven't got time, so let's train it. Whilst that's training. Okay, so app successfully trained, good. Um, you're supposed to test it as well, but let's go straight through to publish because that's much more fun. And it says publishing complete, refer to the list of endpoints to access your URL, right? So let's do that, click on that. And we've got some endpoints, right. Endpoint down the bottom, what does this mean? Okay, so this is our API endpoint, so as code, we can hit an API endpoint and it will kind of hit that model. What do I mean by that? Right, let's open it in a new tab so you can see. So this massively long URL has a query at the end of it, which you can probably not see. Um, that's the question, that's the utterance. So we can put in there, oh, I should not have done that. Um, we can put in there, What is the weather in London? Now, that's a tame example, really, because that was an exact phrase that like, we told the bot about, so we're not really asking it to be very clever at all, uh, but we'll come back to that in a bit. What we've got back is JSON. We've got the query, we've got the top scoring intent of weather, we've got a score for it, and we've got some entities, the entity of London. Now, as a developer, this is way easier to work with than that string, okay? Because I can be like, if it was weather, great, I know what to do now. I need to go and get the weather for London, okay? So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this code here. Right, now, let's come back to this bot. So at the moment, this bot is just echoing back everything we say, 
Now, we don't really want it to do that. That's kind of boring. What we want to do is stop it running. What we want it to do here is a couple of different things. We want it to send the sentence to Lewis, figure out if it's weather, like figure out if the intent is weather. And if it is, then we want to go and get the weather and display it to the user. OK? Seems fair? Right. So here are here is one thing I made earlier that I'm not going to make right now, um, and hopefully you'll see why. This is JSON, right? And this is what we get when we call um, our API endpoint, OK? We just need to turn that JSON into C Sharp code so we can work with it. That's a fairly boring process. Let me show you it so you know it's not, I'm not cheating. Um, all this stuff's on GitHub as well, so don't, like, you can go and get it later, right? So here is a class called getIntent, OK? Much like that PowerShell one, it's just making a get request. It's making a get request to this massively long URL um, that probably might not exist anymore, but we'll try in a minute. If not, we'll replace it with our own one to go and get the weather. Um, and then all it's doing is it's converting that JSON and deserializing it into an object that we have called Lewis response. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that we can create a new one of those. And don't worry if you are not a C Sharp developer, OK? Like, let this bit kind of, if you want to, just kind of wash over you. Come back and look at the code later. Hopefully, you will take away from this is not as super complicated as you think it was going to be, right? Create a new one of these Lewis things. Um, and then let's get all the intents. Uh, and what we need to do is pass the message that the user sent. So we know from this example down here that this was echoing back what the user wrote. So we can actually just take this bit here that we don't understand at all turn context.activity.text, but we know from looking, we understand that that is the text that the user sent us because we've seen it, like we've seen it play out in the sample. Okay. Did not mean to press that button, but let's go with it anyway. Okay. Once we've done that, hopefully that's going to go and get the intents and come back. We can then look at that JSON that comes back. Um, I'm going to do some horrible things. I'm also going to misspell intent, so let's just fix that. Well, I'm going to do some horrible things that the developers in the room, um, please don't hate me. I'm going to assume there is one intent that comes back, and we always want the first one for the sake of argument. Okay, let's look at that actual intent, and let's see if it is actually weather. Okay, what do I mean by that? In here, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this list of intents, and I'm picking the top one, and I'm seeing whether it's equal to weather. If it's anything else, and our model might have like weather and flights and something else, and if the user said something complete garbage, this will just be either be empty or have nothing in it. And it will just say like none, I think, the bottom one. It will have none in it instead. Okay, so it won't go and try and get the weather. Okay. So that's the thing we're checking for. Is it the weather? If it is the weather, um, we need to go and get the weather, but we need to know the location. Where's the location? It's in the entities. Yeah. So we need to go and get the location out of the entities. So let's just go and do that. Again, developers in the room, I'm picking the first entity. I know that's possibly not always correct. You might have more than one entity. If you said, what's the weather in New York and Japan, it is going to kill you. Um, But this is just a kind of simple example, right? So now we've got the location, and we know we want to get the weather. So the next thing is to actually go and get the weather. Again, that's not that complicated. Let me show you. Turns out there's an API endpoint for getting the weather. Who knew? Okay, there's actually loads of them. I'm picking this one. It's called Open Weather Map. It's free to use. Um, it's got a load of like things on it. You can do different like, types of information. You can get it for tomorrow or just for today, whatever. I'm just getting like, the weather, and I'm passing it the location. So here, I'm taking the location as a parameter. I'm passing it in the string, the query string, like this uh, string here, um, and just calling this as a, uh, like a HTTP get, returning the results, and, and then all I'm doing is parsing them. Again, the results come back in JSON. I parse them into an object, and then I'm just building up this string that just says, you know, right now in wherever your location is, it's whatever the weather is, or sorry, whatever the temperature is, like main temp, degrees, with, and then a description of the weather. So like it's 18 degrees with cloudy skies, maybe, right? Um, so that's the thing I'm doing. 
Again, hopefully you're very not super complicated. What it means we can do in here, though, is say file weather, is just make a new like object called weather. It means we can call it. Um, and then let's just have that description, that weather description. Um, get current weather, and we want to pass it the location that we just got, we worked out earlier, two lines up. OK, fine. So that gives us the weather, which is good. Um, and then we just need to post that back to the user, send that back as a message. Now, this line down here that we commented, we know that sends a message to the user. So let's take that. OK, let's not try and reinvent the wheel. Let's paste it in there. And rather than saying echo rah, 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 whatever this was, yeah, let's get rid of all of that. And instead, we're just going to send back that description. OK, so this may or may not work first time. If it doesn't work, it's an excellent learning opportunity. So normally I kind of do this in two runs and be like, let's try it half. Let's try with just the like the lowest bit and let's try with just the weather bit and we'll see. But let's just go straight for it and see what happens. So we're doing all this locally still. So let's try. What's the weather in London? So we'll think about it. Hopefully it's going all the way to Lewis and coming back and then going to the weather API and coming back to say, right now in London, it's 23.6 degrees with a few clouds, OK? Hopefully, let's try something crazy. So tell me the weather, spelt incorrectly, in, um, I don't know, Chicago, Jason's homeland. Right now in Chicago, it's 25 degrees with clear sky. They have better weather than we do, right? So in, hopefully, 15, 20 minutes, We've gone from this kind of sample into something genuinely useful. And we haven't had to write tons and tons of code. What does this mean? So from this point, what I could do is right click on here and publish this up to Azure, up to that bot instance. Okay? It takes a little bit of time, um, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to show you one that I did earlier, Blue Peter style. Um, you will have to take it from me that it's exactly the same. Um, I'll show you it's exactly the same. Uh, I think it's this one. If not, it'd be funny. Um, so once it's published, you can come right back here to the testing web chat place, and you can say, what's the weather in London? And make sure that everything's OK. Make sure it's published OK. Make sure there's no other problems. Um, you know, make sure everything's all lined up. Yep, perfect. Once you're happy, you can then go into channels. OK. You can click Microsoft, I did this last night. So you can click Microsoft Teams. It's literally a one-step process to enable this to work in Microsoft Teams. You click that, you agree to the terms and conditions, um, and then you're in. What does that mean? It means that you can have that same conversation in a bot with, in Microsoft Teams. Let me just quickly show you this. Now, this is half the story, because it's not in the App Store. It's not an app at this point. It is just you talking to a bot. Um, and something went wrong last night, which is fine. Um, what's the weather? In, let's pick another random small city in the UK, Chichester. Um, right now in Chichester. So this is now in Teams, exactly the same code, doing exactly the same thing. I didn't need to do any extra work. It is lit up in Teams. Okay, that's the powerful bit about the bot framework. Once you've written it for the bot framework, you can throw it out to all these different channels. Okay, so we've gone from nothing to building this kind of weather bot in around about 20 minutes and having it running in Teams. So. Let's come back to the slides and continue. So let's say you do all that, but not for the weather. Let's say you do it for something else. What else can you use? What else helps you in this process of building applications um, for Teams and building this stuff out? So Application Insights. I'm sure you've all heard of Application Insights, but how many of you actually use them day to day? So this is most people's view of what Application Insights look like. And they don't much look past this. But actually, it's totally worth digging into, especially for things like bots. Okay? You get a live metric stream. Okay? So that's interesting by itself. If things go wrong, it gives you a real-time view of what's happening. But you can also add your own telemetry and logging entries into App, um, into App Insights. What that means is, as your code steps through different things, like trying to get the weather, going and calling this API, going to call the weather, whatever else it is, um, you can have that written out as events that you can see. So this is um, a real screenshot from 
remember this. There's an event at the top there, it's called input in one moment, and I've replied with the standard help message, okay? Because for whatever reason, I couldn't figure out how to turn in one moment into a valid date time, okay? That's an actual error message. So you see that in App, App Insights, you can search for it, you can look for them over time, it's super, super useful. So that helps you understand. Once you've published and you're running it in the web, it helps you understand what happens next. Here's a better example of that, actually. So you can see the things I'm typing, and you can see how they show up because um, you can write your own stuff in here. So not only that, you get a ton of information along with each thing as well about exactly where it's coming from, the user, what you did about it, like all this other stuff that makes it really, really useful to kind of debug and figure out what's going on at scale um, when you've published. Okay. So let's shift gears. You built your application. It might be a bot, it might be something else. I know we're focused on bots because everybody wants to build a bot. Um, but let's say you built a thing, okay? But how do you actually get it into Teams? We've seen it running in Teams, but you needed to go into a zero and click a link. So you can't really go and give that link to all your users because they'll never find it. Um, so how do you actually get it into Teams? So what you need to do is take your thing, like your bot, your tab, your channel extension, whatever else it is from those ones we talked about earlier, and you wrap it into a thing called a Teams app, okay? The way you do that is by filling out a JSON file called a manifest file. And a manifest file is just a description. It's a descriptive file um, of what your app looks like. It's things like the name, the description, the icons, who the publisher is, what its capabilities are. Um, and then from there, you can publish it. Now, there's three different ways you can publish. You can publish it just for you. That's called sideloading, okay? Literally, only on your machine, it's good for developers, right? You've built a thing, you're not sure if it works, run it just for you in Teams, okay? You can publish it to your company store, okay? You need to be an admin, but what this means is that users, when they go to the app store, they see a section of the app store with your company name, and they see company-issued apps in there, okay? That's like a nice halfway house if it's an internal or an org app, okay, that you want to, like, have everyone in your org use, but you don't want it to go like on the actual Teams app store. Like an HR bot is a perfect example of that, right? And then all the way up to publishing it on the Teams app store for anyone in the world to get to. The manifest file is horrible and disgusting. Um, so manifest file is horrible and disgusting. Luckily, there is a thing called a manifest editor, which makes it all a lot easier. So uh, this is also where I will show you the card editor that we referred to earlier. So. Within Teams, there is a app called App Studio. You can get it in the App Store, it's free, okay? If you're building anything, any kind of apps on Teams, go and get the App Studio. Two reasons. The first is the card editor, okay? Which lets you build up example cards, see what they look like, and gives you the code for them, okay? So you get a live preview. Um, you can add text in, you can add images, you can add buttons, you can see what they all look like. And as you're doing it, you get all the code, okay? Get the code in JSON, you get it in C Sharp, and you get it in Node. So whatever sample you're dropping it into, you can just take this, okay? So this is super useful if you're trying to understand how this stuff hangs together, how you build out this code for these buttons and these kind of cards and stuff. The reason I came here, though, is for the manifest editor. This is how you create apps nicely. So go to create a new app. This is the same JSON file that you need to fill out. What they've done is they've put a decent UI around it with validation steps. So this UI understands that like, the short name needs to be 30 characters or less. It understands that the long name can't be the same as the short name. Both are required. These are the things you need to fill out for your app. So there's some descriptive stuff about who you are and like branding and stuff. And then down here, you've got capabilities. So your app can be a mixture of different things. Like It could just be a bot. So for our weather thing, maybe it's just a bot. But it could also be a bot and a tab and a connector, let's say. So you've now got a weather app. You can also open a tab, so you want to show a nice picture of the weather, and maybe a connector, so we can ping into a channel every time the weather changes, right? All of those make an app, yeah? That's one app, so you've got these capabilities. So you get to choose the capabilities, so if we were doing ads, we'd go down to bots, we'd set it up, we'd say it's an existing box, we recreated it, we'd give it a name, we pull the app idea out of Azure, um, we choose what scopes we want, all that sort of stuff. This is easier than building it by hand, believe me. You come down here, you can then install it, sideload it just for you, that personal scope thing we talked about. You can download the zip file, so the zip file that contains that manifest JSON file and the two icons that you need. 
and you can also submit this to the App Store. So this is the place to go when you are ready to create a Teams application. Yeah? Go to the App Studio, go use the Manifest Editor, create it that way. Don't try and build the Manifest JSON by hand. You totally can do if you want to. The schema references on the web. Good luck. OK? Um, this came out like... This came out like maybe a year ago, and before that, we were all using like hand-built manifest JSON files, and it was a horrible time um, because it would kind of go wrong, and you wouldn't know why. And yeah, so definitely use the manifest editor. Once you're ready um, to actually publish, so we talked about going to the company store. Like, that's a good thing to do if you're a big organization and it makes sense. But if you're building something for kind of worldwide appeal, um, absolutely, you should do that. Why not? Um, the couple of steps you need to go through. So you need to go through like a registration process. And this is really similar to like a, an iTunes app submission process, right? You need to register as an app seller. Um, your app has to be free, OK? Now, that's a bit of a gotcha for some people. Like, you put, put a ton of effort into this stuff. All the apps on Teams are free. That is changing. Announced at Ignite. Um, that's going to change. Um, there's a verification process. So this is kind of in two parts. Um, there's like an automated verification part where it checks all the schema stuff, it checks like all the links are valid, checks a bunch of other stuff, make sure the code doesn't crash. But then, like actual real humans install your application and use it and give you feedback. My experience was that that was actually really good. I always spoke to the same people each time. They were responsive. It felt like they wanted to get the app into the store. They weren't just being a barrier for barrier's sake. They were just maintaining a quality bar. And they will do things like, they will suggest things like, you know, when you first install the bot, it doesn't have a nice welcome message. That's kind of off-putting to users that don't know what to do next. It's like they will really think about it. So um, that's a, that was a positive process for me. Don't expect that to be instant, though. If you're lining this up with a marketing campaign, don't submit it the day before your marketing campaign kicks off. Like, this takes a couple of weeks. And don't expect it to get through the first time. Um, if you do everything right, your app will end up here on the App Store um, for anyone to use, um, and you'll be published. You'll be a published app author. So go update LinkedIn. So what happens next? What happens after that? Well, you are now a fully-fledged app developer, and you have an app which people can use, which is cool. But people find problems. They find bugs because they use your application. So suddenly, you're responsible. Like, you're responsible for looking after this app. And some people are better at this than others. I'm terrible at this, by the way. Um, there's a long-running bug in Remember This that I will fix one day. But it's free, so. Um, but actually, in the old days of doing this stuff, you know, the old days of software release, it was on CDs. So you'd, like, have a gold release. You'd work up to a certain point. You'd have a cutoff date. It would go to the printers. You'd print 50,000 CDs. If you found a bug the next day, sorry, it's already gone to press, right? We'll fix that in six months, 12 months, 24 months. Who knows, right? Now, it's, you can update this stuff instantly. You can go back to your code editor, make a change, upload it, and everybody, because all your, all your team's app is, is a wrapper around the bot that's published. So you can republish that bot. You can change what it does. You can fix its bugs. Everybody will get them. So your app is like a perfect SaaS model. Um, and you can update that wherever, whenever. And that actually is a huge opportunity for single-person developers, indie developers, and small teams, because it means you can fix and fail fast, right? You don't, you know, you don't need dedicated QA and testing resource, right? It's great if you have it. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for, like, QA resource. But if you don't have it, guess who's really good at finding bugs like a real user? A real user, right? And actually, if you can turn those bugs around, users will forgive you a lot, because they're not used to that. Like, if they point a bug out and you respond within 24 hours and say, yeah, I fixed that one, they're like, wow, this is amazing. They've forgotten that your app was buggy in the first place, right? OK, so what if you've listened to all of this, but you're still like, meh, I'm not sure I've got the time or the inclination to really dig into this dev stuff. Have you got anything that's a little bit easier or a little bit faster or that isn't going to take a load of my time or isn't just a brand new thing? Um, like, what do I do? What, what can you do in this space? OK. Has anyone heard of app templates for Microsoft Teams? OK, good. Oh, bad, good. Um, so they're new. They're a couple of weeks old. Um, they are. 
They're a bit like products, okay, in that Microsoft have produced them. A bit like products, they are, they solve a real world problem. They are well maintained, well architected. They come with documentation. They come with a solution architecture diagram. They come with a full deployment guide. You run them in your Azure tenant, but they are free and they're open source and they're made by Microsoft. You can take them entirely as they are and deploy them, or you can take them, modify them for what you need to do, repackage, rebrand, whatever, and go. They're really interesting at the moment. So, this is where you go. This is your landing point for Teams app templates. Okay, if you look at the published dates, you'll notice all this stuff is really new. aka.ms Teams app templates. When you do that, you'll end up here. Uh, oh, there you go. Fifth of the fifth. Okay, yeah. Um, so, this lists the app templates that you can use today. Okay. Right now, there are three. Okay. I think there will be more than three. Like, but right now, there are three. They are an icebreaker bot. What on earth is an icebreaker bot? Okay, so it's a bot. The idea is it kind of helps forge new connections inside your organization. And it does that by randomly pairing two people together. Okay? Now, there's a couple of rules around that. Uh, it's opt-in, so you've got to be in for it, up for it, right? But then at a set time, like Monday 9 a.m. or Friday, whatever, whatever makes sense for you, yeah, it will literally pick two random people and go, hey, you two have been paired. Go for a chat. If you're in the same location, go meet up for coffee. Or let's do a Teams meeting. You're both free on these times. Like, it takes away all the excuses, okay? Microsoft have been using this internally for a while. They've been through a couple of iterations. There's a really interesting blog post, actually, by one of the leading um, PMs on the Teams team around how they've been using a variant of this all the way through Teams' lifecycle as the, as the team has grown, and they haven't wanted to lose that kind of community spirit. Um, so, yeah. Really interesting. You can take that, run that in your org today. So we're running it um, currently in Modality. It's kind of interesting to see who's in and who's out. Um, list search is the next one. That is a messaging extension. So the things that come down the bottom with the compose things that you click on, this is for querying SharePoint lists. So Microsoft get that a bunch of really interesting information is in SharePoint lists, and they're exposing a bot that you can use to quickly search a list and pull back a nice card of all relevant information, drop it into a conversation. That's super useful for lots of companies. Maybe less useful is this next one, custom stickers, um, which is based on the idea that actually the GIFs, are, the GIFs that you get with Teams, maybe you've got your own ideas for GIFs and you want to make some more. This idea is like you can make your own images and GIFs, you can load them up, and again, they then appear in this messaging extension thing. You can share them with other people. You can basically make your own Giphy um, within your org. Good idea, bad idea, jury's out, I think. Um, so, these are all open on GitHub. These are also accepting community contributions. So, people from outside of Microsoft may well add their own solutions into here. Um, I'm thinking of doing one myself. Um, each one of these has full documentation. Each one of these has a solution diagram like this, an architecture diagram with descriptions. And each one has a deployment guide that you don't need to be an expert to follow through. Like you need to have an Azure subscription and you need to be able to follow steps, but that is it. Now, these are really good for a number of different people. They're good for developers because they're good for ideas. These are Microsoft developers doing best practice Teams apps. Yeah? So even if none of them line up to the things you want to build, take them anyway and just see how it's architected. See how they're putting this stuff together. It's good if you're just starting out on this journey because you can take this code, modify it, break it, understand how it works. And actually, these are good for anyone who just wants to like deploy these apps. If these line up to things that you want to do, if surfacing information in SharePoint lists is something that is on your to-do list in Teams, then like, just take this and deploy it as is. You don't need to make any changes if you don't want to. You don't need to know anything about how the code works. Still not sure. Um, another shameless plug. The final bullet point here around a video walkthrough of the, uh, the icebreaker bot is actually me doing uh, a walkthrough on YouTube. So you can go and look at that. That's literally a bit like what I just did here, starting from absolutely nothing with an empty resource group, following the deployment guide, all the way to icebreaker bot working in Teams. So if you don't think you can do it, watch the video, just follow along. Yes? Oh, I get to throw this at you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you said they were running that internally. Is there a notion or idea of how much that costs for all those as you are? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that was really good. Like, that was being sort of like kind of top feedback to that team around like, great, you're putting this in as your, how much does it all cost? They are coming back and updating all that documentation with a whole section around what will this cost, okay? Um, they're backfilling, so list search has it because it's the newest. They're backfilling for the other two now. There's definitely going to be a estimated costs in Azure um, so you can understand what you're getting into. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, where are we at? Time, probably. Um, technology is evolving. Um, bots are replacing apps. Data is king. Are you evolving to ride this wave? Are you kind of taking this stuff on board? If you haven't already built a Teams app for your organization, hopefully by the end of today, like, there is nothing stopping you. There is no reason you can't do this. You do not need to be like a hardened developer to do this. And there are loads and loads of tools, low code and no code solutions out there to help you. So grow, step, evolve, step out of your comfort zone. You might be surprised at what happens. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Tom Morgan. I work at Monarchy Systems. And we have... These are obviously to work in teams, that's what we're here discussing today. If you've done that core stuff in Lyrics and whatever, can you plug that in easily to Alexa yep. and other services? Absolutely. So, um, Gary Pretty of the Bot Builder community, uh, one of the members of the Bot Builder community, a couple of slides back. Um, uh, is doing some really interesting things with bot framework and Google Voice and Alexa integration. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The stuff you write in bot framework, all those other mediums are just other channels. Yeah, so that's one of the key benefits of building a bot framework is that Teams is just one delivery mechanism. It's the one we're focusing on, um, but equally you could use that technology and, and embed it in a website as well as having it on a chat, you know, Alexa, whatever. Cool. Oh, sorry. Uh, can the, the bots that are listed on the store for free, can they talk to paid for subscription SaaS yeah. services? That's yeah, absolutely. It's not a, um, yes, it, it was more of a, I think, not said from any position of authority, um, I think the reason they're free is that was the quickest thing to do. Yeah. Yes, you can absolutely have them tied to other services that require money. It's not like a moralistic standpoint or anything. And like I say, that is, I think, changing. Um, so you will be able to charge money up front for apps or tie them to a subscription service. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thanks very much. <laughs>